Hey, good morning, or uh, good day, or whatever time it happens to be in your part of the world. This is uh, back, welcome back to the old foundry. We're going to cover another subject right now. Uh, it's going to be molding, okay? But uh, now, in an earlier video, I did mention what's called a cheek, okay? Now, if you have your, your, your flask here, your cope and your drag, and normally you'll have, uh, you know, uh, the vast majority of the time, most of your castings are going to be in the drag, and this is just going to be the cover to keep the molten metal from uh, flowing everywhere, and also to form the back side or the one side of the casting, right? But what happens if these two pieces aren't good enough for what you're trying to make? Okay, well, our predecessors, the molders of the past, uh, figured a little something out that's called a cheek, okay? Uh, it goes in between these two, all right? Now, if I was trying to cast, let's say, a billet. Now, for those of you who didn't watch the billet video, it's basically a form of mold, of metal that you're making for let's say a machine shop, okay? And the one, you know, it can be almost any shape. It can be solid or it can be cored. Uh, in other words, have a hole go through it so that it's in more of a ring rather than a solid uh, round shape. And uh, you know, you make those as a molder. You make those for the uh, machinists who need to make. Uh, other things like shafts, rings, uh, I don't know, any, 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 think about it. You know, if you have a chunk of metal and you've got a lathe or a milling machine and you need to make X thing, uh, now you've got a batch of metal that you can whittle all the way and make the thing that you need. That's called a billet, okay? Now, when you're pouring a billet as a molder, you need to have a base so that the molten metal doesn't just flow over, fall out like, like sand in a in a sand uh, clock, or rather a time a. Uh, well, you got the idea. Hour hourglass, okay. So you need to have a base. Now the base is usually the the drag. You take and ram that up solid, and then you would put. See if I can get something. Pretend that from here up is gone, okay? You just have this cylindrical shape. You're trying to make a billet this size, that high, for the machine shop, okay? And uh, they're going to make some uh, rings, small rings. They're going to have to drill and bore that out, of course, but it's going... Oh, that thing moved on me, scared me. Oh, wow. Anyway, so your job as a molder is to make this chunk for the machine shop so that they can make what they apparently can't get their hands on very quickly. You can do it fa faster. You've got the materials, you've got the, uh, the, the, the metal, you can do it faster, okay? Now, a lot of times they'll go ahead and uh, the machine shop will order stuff in this form that's been made by a huge uh, foundry, and that a, you know when they uh, make it, it's extruded out of a uh, a big a die, and it doesn't touch anything else other than that nice smooth uh, metal die, and so the outside is as smooth as the inside. Okay, when you're using uh, sand, the outside is going to be pebbly. It's going to be you know, if you look very close, it's going to be bumpy, okay? Uh, that first layer is going to be taken away by the machine shop, and then they'll have nice, nice metal if you cast this correctly. But you still need a base, okay? Now let's say that the, uh, yeah, that's about the good size. Let's say you've got that base. I don't really, oh, okay, maybe. Pretend you've got solid sand right there. I'm going to put this down here to represent that solid sand. So you've got a nice uh, 
you know, not only solid, but smooth area right here. And you'll put this in here and you'll find that this is just a touch small higher than this, or rather a touch, a touch taller than this is uh, thick. Okay. Well, there's a way to, to repair that problem. You make a cheek and a cheek is nothing more than a piece that will go in between the drag and the cope. Okay. It can be as thick as you want it. It's just, it's called a cheek in that it'll stay in between the cope and the drag. Okay. Now here's some cheek, uh, a cheek. I put it down there. Fits just right. Okay. Now I've added that much, that much, uh, to the whole affair. Instead of just having this thickness of metal, I've got that thickness and the thickness so that the machine shop has more to work with. Okay. Now get this right. Okay. Now you're going to make something that tall. You're going to cast something that tall. Okay. And the top of this cylinder would be sticking out of the sand just about just just tall enough for you to be able to uh, wrap it and get it out of the sand. Okay. Now that's one example of how you would use a cheek. That's not why I uh, made this video today. I just wanted to introduce this piece of material or this 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 piece of equipment to you in furtherance to make something else. We put this away. Okay, now let's get these things settled so I can illustrate well enough. Especially you, you uh, machinists, you've been online, most of you, have seen a whole lot of people, seen a whole lot of uh, originators or uh, people who've made their, their own videos, and most of you will be uh, familiar with the work of Keith Fenner, okay? I think he's probably the first uh, YouTube creator that I came upon back in a couple, three years ago. And I was uh, loving the work that he did and, and all his, his uh, ways of, you know, fixing problems, of, of, of originating repairs in certain ways. And uh, a lot of them are his own, his own making, of his own making. Okay. Now, anybody who knows Keith Fenner knows that so far the last few years he's been uh championing championing a uh an event of uh what's in your toolbox event right and now this is this is basically supposed to be to help the up and coming machinist okay somebody who's not just goofing around who really wants to learn who really wants to get into the trade uh become a, an excellent machinist you can't become a machinist without tools, okay? So he's, he's been gathering up <coughs> contributors. He's, uh, people have been volunteering uh, in machines, not machines so much, but tools that, uh, and, and the uh, measurement devices and, and such things that helps a machinist do his job easier and more accurately. And, um, <coughs> I said, uh, when I saw that, I said, you know what? I don't see a lot of molders sending anything. You know, there's, there's something that a molder can contribute 
to this. And I said to myself, I said, you know, one of the things that's, that's helpful in a machine shop uh, is a lead hammer. Okay. Uh, you can't always get your hands on lead. You, uh, you can buy a lead hammer, but they're, they're expensive. Uh, a newcomer, an up and, go, up and coming uh, new machinist is not going to have a bunch of bucks. Uh, so, you know, it, it's good to have somebody give them a hammer. Uh, not everybody can make hammers, though. Not everybody has access to lead. Okay, though, if I suppose if you had a mold for making a hammer, you might be able to find some lead somewhere. You might be able to get some scrap. You might be able to melt it down and pour yourself a lead hammer so that you can, uh, you know, make a little uh, minor adjustments in the lathe or minor adjustments wherever you have something, uh, you know, clamped down, okay? So, first thing I thought of is, uh, I, you know, I've got my own 3D printer now. I had in my mind exactly what what should be good now it's not i wouldn't i mean nobody needs a huge lead hammer all you need is something that you can tap easy on your uh project and maneuver it you know nicely easily in micrometers right tiny little bits so that it uh you, you know you'll have it in place where you want before you finally uh cinch down on your on your wrench if you're the machine if you're a machine I'd say okay so I designed designed it's it's so crude you, you can't say really designed it's not like I went down and, and, and made a lot of uh, calculations and all that but I remembered how we uh, made some uh, lead hammers for the machine shop in the foundry when I was on in the Navy and it was, you know, well reserved. I mean, well deserved and well received. They, they really loved it. Okay, so I, I remembered what these. Uh, well, actually, they didn't look exactly like this. I made this simpler for the uh, for the machinist who's going to be casting his own lead hammers. Okay. Now, of course, I used I used the 3D printer for the main part of it, and some stuff left over. From other projects in uh, in the in my my little foundry here, so it's dirty right now. Here's the main the main part of the mold. Okay, you take this half and this half. You put these two faces together, and then you'll have a place up here. To pour the molten metal into okay now what I'm going to be doing because I don't have a machine shop and I don't have uh, the drills and the, and the uh, lathes to be able to and mills to be able to do this what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some like five pairs of these and send them off uh, to be uh, to be put into the you know the toolboxes along with other finished tools now it's up to up to Keith or anybody else who wants to do it but it, it would be a very good thing for these faces to be uh, machined off so that they fit solidly against each other okay we don't need any any holes in there we don't need any rough spots so that the molten metal can work their way through the crack and start leaking out the sides all right so as flat as these can be the flatter they are when you put them into let's say a vise and clamp them up the lead won't have anywhere to go okay now another thing when you have these both together you got to have a hole in there for the handle now even if I had a machine shop to make a hole in a handle for a handle who knows what size handle these guys are going to get their hands on Presumably it'll be basically a, a, a pipe, but are they going to get a 3 8 inch pipe? Are they going to get a half inch, 3 quarters inch pipe? Who knows, okay? So it would probably be a good idea for whoever, you know, faces this off that they don't put a hole in the side. Allow the uh, guy who's going to receive these, guy or gal, who's going to receive these 
to make their own hole uh, you know because they'd be able to make it just the right size and once they clamp this down there wouldn't be any gap around the the handle for the metal to leak out right okay so but they need to have this first to be able to do any of that so I wanted to make it now on average I think they, they had like five uh, toolboxes that they fill so I said to myself hey you know I got I got scrap here I got stuff here that'll that'll act as a really good uh, mold for for molder uh, for uh, lead lead hammers why don't I go ahead and make some of those well it would take a long time I mean as lazy as I am it would take a long time for me to make a mold pour it make a mold pour it make a mold pour it and then I remembered hey remember stack molding anyone who's ever been in the Navy foundry has been exposed to stack molding because anybody who's been in the Navy foundry has been exposed to making plaques okay now plaques the, the, they're just designs uh, that re usually represent somebody's command uh, they're usually only let's say that big around and they can easily fit in a 12 by 12 uh, mold well if you make a bunch of these and make it thick enough well you make it 12 by 12 just to keep standardization you know in play okay so that it'll you know if you can use it for as a cheek in your regular 12 by 12 mold that much better all right but this I basically just put these together for stack molding for this occasion now if you're let me move you closer so you can see what I'm doing here and how I can kind of illustrate it a basic rule when you're making a mold is that no matter what you have at least an inch of sand between the molten metal and the the form in which you're you're uh, pushing the sand into the flask or the or the uh, cheek or the stack molding uh, unit whatever all right at least because the uh, the the inch of sand will not only act as a strength a, a strong wall against intrusion uh, because don't forget the molten metal when you pour it in there acts just like water okay if you have a hole in a bucket that water ain't staying in the bucket it'll pour out that hole uh, and uh, it'll be a waste of time for you to put that water in the bucket well the same thing is for a mold if you have a way for that molten metal while it's still hot to flow out of the mold cavity it'll take that way okay so an inch at least all the way around like an inch barrier I got all this junk in the way here let's see if I can move you and then move this and then point you downwardly and maybe even settle down for a second okay at least an inch see my marks I want to make sure that there's at least an inch all the way around so that you have a strong wall of sand to keep the metal from flowing out and if there's a little a little uh, uh, you know like a gap in there the the inch of sand will have a cooling effect on the molten metal and possibly keep it from flowing all the way out okay now an inch of an inch of sand all the way around and the same thing from the the uh, the mold cavity to the surface that you're going to strike off okay Now that's approximately an inch of sand right there. All right. You're not necessarily going to have that much pressure being exerted this way because it's the all, all the other ones that are going to be on this is going to be buttressing or backing up that surface and the the little bit of uh, hydraulic pressure that the uh, metal is going to be exerting against that sand is not going to be enough to push all the other sand away. And ruin this okay 
but you must have at least an inch of sand what happens if this is the only one you're going to pour and you're just going to have a top okay just make sure that you have plenty of sand all the way around that uh, will prevent this stuff from flowing out all right well, that's the idea essentially molding using these see if i can get you back molding using these is the same basic method as using the larger uh, cope and drag sections okay and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get things set up here and then i'll bring you back and uh we'll start ramming up okay i'll be right back i've got everything all more or less set up here uh of course I'm going to be saying the same thing over and over again, and it's not because I think anybody that's watched these before doesn't retain the information well enough. It's because I know somewhere along the line we're going to have people that that have uh, have just joined us and really don't uh, they do not know exactly what I'm doing. Okay, now for those of you who are brand new, I highly encourage you to start off at, at my earliest uh, video that I put out the the earliest date okay the first ones because the way I put them online they were as if you were going to school now if you go to school they don't teach you how to make a mold the first day all right they got to teach you uh, basics it's almost like uh, trying to teach a, a carpenter how to make a house well what's the first thing they do is they teach them how to make a nice strong foundation for the house all right the earliest videos that I put out are the videos that help you with your foundation. Gives you the basic information by which you can make a, uh, a good mold, a good uh, casting. All right. So here's our parting powder. Parting powder used to keep the wet sand or the oily sand, depending on if you're using green sand or Petrobon sand. From sticking to either the uh, the molding board or the patterns you just you don't put so much on there that you have a, a really thick piece I mean don't put it put enough on there to make it measurable okay you're just trying to add, make a barrier between the, the pattern and the, uh, the sand. Now the one thing I have noticed <clears throat> when using green sand, you got to keep it covered all the time. All right. Because this stuff, I mean, even the fact that we're here in Florida with this ungodly uh, humidity, it still dries out faster than you want it to. To be a, a viable sand a good molding medium okay now you riddle the sand or if you now this is a riddle in the foundry in the anywhere else it'd be sifter okay but what you're trying to do is you're trying to put a layer of nice uh nice uh, fine sand over the surfaces you're going to mold and you don't want a bunch of these little clay balls or any actually anything that isn't sand there in here i think i need to add a little bit more now what you don't do is you don't fill this thing all the way up to the top and then start ramming it okay for those of you who are new you must do what we call tucking t-u-c-k tucking the sand in and there's the bad part about not having any pins tucking uh, the sand in around the around the uh, pattern okay you just take your little fingers and you tuck it everywhere you want it go all all around the uh, pattern okay everywhere tuck it as best you can even out here where there is no pattern you want to have a nice smooth surface 
providing you have a smooth surface, you're, you're, you know, you've got, in this case, I will have a smooth surface because I got plexiglass here. And we want this all to be nice and smoothly conforming to the patterns. Okay. Okay. Now we haven't covered everything yet, so I still need to do it. Now there's an advantage and disadvantage of stack molding. The advantage is that you can put many, many molds on top of each other and pour it in one big stack, providing that your, your casting that you're trying to make is all going to be in what's normally thought of as the drag. Okay, now almost got this stuff tucked. Okay, now you see that everything is all rugged. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, I'm not scratching off this level because everything is still. It's got all these different dips and everything, and the sand will conform inside there. And keep in mind that if you have something that you're ramming up that's kind of tall, like the edges of these molds are tall, uh, be careful on your ramming up. You don't want to, especially if it's made out of out of uh, wood. If you hit it too hard, you're going to deform your pattern, and your casting is going to take on the form of that pattern. So if you don't want a deformed casting, you don't mess up your pattern. Sure, hoping that I'm giving it plenty of pressure to get down and make everything nice and solid inside those deep parts. I'm pretty sure I'm doing it, but got to make sure. All right. Now this is going to be the bottom most mold. So it'll be just a little bit different than the rest of them. The top one is just going to be just a, a blank, uh, other than where, when you're going to be uh, making the pouring basin and punching the sprue through, you know, the very first sprue through the top. Okay, make sure everything is nice and solid and you strike it off now this is a little more important to make sure this is uh, kind of smooth because this is going to this is going to form this is going to form the other side well, in this case, it's just going to be on the bottom. But this is a basic, uh, whenever you do this, you're going to have to do this for all the others. Because this is going to form the top half of your mold. Now, if it's a large area, you want it that smooth, you have to make this smooth. Okay, don't forget, you do still have to vent these. I'm not going to use the big vent that I normally use because I don't want to screw up the uh, the pattern in here. So I'm going to just do it easy. And if I touch anything, I won't try and go through anything. For those of you who've never done this before. This is to allow the generated gases and, and uh, water vapor 
to escape instead of forming bubbles in the casting. Now essentially so far it all uh, this has been exactly the same way as all the other molds that I've shown you is going to be made. Okay, we've put parting powder on it. <clears throat> we've tucked, well we riddled the sand so it's nice and smooth. We've tucked the sand and then we've rammed the sand until we struck, stroke it, uh, striked it off. And uh, now we're going to flip it, okay? Now this is a little easier than the other ways because this is this is basically, you know, to where you can grip it easy. Okay? Let's see if I, it might be easier if I just do it reversed. Okay, you see how nice and smooth this is. Now, the last time I had a hard time picking this up, or you know, the other pattern, when I was making this, is because I realized afterwards, it wasn't because like the, the sand was gripping this surface, it's because, uh, well, we had vacuum. You know, it was so it was so locked under the surface that we had a vacuum formed. Okay, and so now I'm going to give it a little bit of the vibration treatment. All right. The one thing you don't want to do is you don't want this to lift up or or because you might be having some. Uh, shallow letters that if you let this lift up because I put this on here uh, you know it might ruin those so I'm going to get something that'll act as a, a counterweight don't want it to go anywhere and I'm sorry about the noise but this is going to assist me you would do I'll put this here what you would do is use a use a wrapper a wrapper can be something as simple as a, a, a you know a crescent wrench or a vice grip and you would just take get it somewhere in the middle here and normally a molder would have been good enough to make himself a nice little hole here and so that it doesn't move around but you can press onto this and it'll press into wood too. You take this and you, with a wrapper, you go all the way around every degree in the, in the uh, compass, okay? But because I do have a vibrator, I don't have to worry about that so much. Now let's see. If she will let loose. Another thing about this wrapper, is you can hit it like that. I have a feeling that if I'm not, 
I've got stuff sticking up in here. Well, most of it is good. The bad part about it is, is that it is so deep that part of it has been pulled out. And I have a sneaking suspicion I know why. Because this molder left a lip. He didn't do what he should have done. He left a lip in here. Okay. All right. So, going to break. Take a break. I'm going to knock this out, and then I'm going to make certain that everybody in here. Now, this didn't have much of a lip, but this one did for some reason. And I'm going to, I'll bring you back when I fix this problem and I rammed up the first one here. Okay, well, I'm more or less, well, it's not perfect. It's not as good as a, uh, as a pattern maker would have done it. But I did fix uh, a bit the, the, dis, you know, the mistakes I made on this. Or I didn't make any mistakes. No, no. There's no molder in existence that can't make an adequately good excuse for why something went wrong. And, uh, well, my excuse is I'm not a pattern maker. So I neglected to check all the edges and make sure that they were, you know, they had the proper draft. So, over here, I made the, uh, the bottom one, the bottom most uh, mold. That's the, part, that's the part of this whole affair that's going to receive the metal first and uh, once that fills up it'll back up and then go into the next one and back up and go into the next one this is number two and you may or may not be able to see but I made some I did some drilling let me empty those out before we start the plan did some drilling so that I had some air able to come in instead of having a vacuum in here making it that much harder for me to uh, to pull the pattern all right of the uh, compass 360 degrees until you see enough movement in there that you can feel there's quite a bit of movement that you can feel the uh, the, the uh, pattern will come out But don't forget, if you do too much of this, or too hard, you can shear off, like for instance, the portions, well it's already in there, the portions that make the hump inside, or the hollow inside these mold, rather these aluminum molds that are going to be hammer molds, you could shear that off. So, the last thing you do, is you tap it. Hopefully you're pressing things back into place. And we have a
a thunderstorm coming in. Uh-oh. Come on. Be nice. Let loose. Okay. It is so deep that there's going to be repairs that need to be made. I think most, almost every one of these. The most important one, though, is the center of this. forget it's not horrendously bad that some of these don't come out each time because if you have extra metal inside these molds those that can be ground off little mold and stay together. Now remember any kind of brush you ever want to use make certain that it is so smooth that you could use it for makeup okay it can't be the least bit uh, stiff. If it's that stiff it's gonna kill you to try and work with. Okay let's see if I can Blow some of the sand out without blowing everything apart. No amount of sand should be left in the mold of uh, cavity. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's take care of any of the sharp edges. The parting powder, and uh, when used in this way, is acting as a kind of a buffer between your brush and the sand. So that you don't go too hard on your sand. We didn't have that much of a problem in the Navy with with this kind of thing because the uh, Petrobon sand was quite a bit uh, more, you know, stronger. It's more plastic and could take. A little bit more uh, touching than the other stuff. Okay, now we're coming up on the part that's going to be a little bit different. Let me blow that out. Get it. Try to get it. Now, don't get close to close to this when you are blowing things out because it's likely to blow things sideways. But you're, just, you're just trying to get the loose stuff out. Okay. Now, 
the idea is to stack these. If I stack this on top of this one like it's going to eventually be stacked, uh, it's not really going to work because, well, the metal will stop right there unless I make a hole. And this is how this stacking works. Let me get this closer. Okay. And I see another crack here, which I don't want. Okay, you stay still. Now, if I was to punch this through there, well, actually, this wouldn't be so bad. I was going to use this. Let's see how much. No, I'm going to try that. I'm going to use this. Now, what you do, you find your spot down here at the very bottom. You try to get this right in the middle. And you push it through what little bit of sand is in there. You try and soften things up. Then you pull it out. Now, I have one more thing to do, but I don't want to have it fall apart on me. So I'm going to look at my look at my mold and see what part would fall if I did it which way. Well, I'm going to go this way, and don't jag it, and don't don't hit it hard, don't let it smack against anything. Pretend you're working with with nitroglycerin, and that any sudden hits will have you blow up. You just all I, the only reason why I'm even exposing this is so that I can take care of this the edges of that hole. Okay now we're gonna see if I ram this hard enough. Okay, I do have it basically in the right direction. And normally this would be on the ground. Let's see if I can. Okay. You carry it all the way to the mold. And at the last second, you turn it easy. And then line it up over the splash basin. Okay. Now the question is, did I line it up good enough? Because I didn't have enough light to be able to see. I'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, for a flashlight. Now, in a perfect world, all of these edges would be lined up perfect, but the problem is, I don't have alignment pins on this so that this is captured by, the, by these in the exact same spot each time. Okay, I've got it right over it. And that's pretty good. Now, each and every time, cover that. Because you don't know what's gonna happen over here. Some of the sand might go flying, okay? I'll put this in my pocket. And then, continue on. Okay, it's all the same process from here on. The biggest thing I wanted to illustrate for you is that you can uh, make more than one 
mold in a stack. Okay. Right now I have two molds worth of uh, casting or, um, you know, mold cavities. Okay. I will be, if I just poured that alone, I would have four halves of a uh, mold, a, a hammer, lead hammer mold. Okay. But I have a few more. I have I have five of them to make. I have six. Let me see how many more. I'm sure I've got one, two, three, four. Yep, I have four more uh, of these to go. The top one is just going to be a blank so that when the metal uh, fills up, it'll back up against that top and form the flat spot, the back, the back side of these. Okay. So I have three more of those to make and uh, one, one top to make. I'll go ahead and make the other three of these and then when I make the top I'll, uh, I'll bring you back, okay? So I'm trying to save on battery and besides seeing me do the same exact thing over and over again is boring. Alright, I'll be back in a bit. Okay, finally as you can see, hope you can see, can't tell what you can see. Well, this wide lens more or less lets you see everything in this room. Anyway, all these molds are made with relatively little repairing to do. Thankfully, I'm not, I mean, if I was a better pattern maker, I'd probably have a lot less repairing to do. But, they're all made, okay. Uh, I don't know, would it take me a couple, three hours? Anyways, so all I got left is just to make the top, the cope, in this case the cope. Bottommost one would still be the drag. That's a cheek, that's a cheek, that's a cheek, that's a cheek. Okay, if you want to be, want to be official about it, want to be technical, okay. So, and it's raining here. We had a little thunderstorm go through, and now it's raining. So I had to shut the uh, garage door, and now it's warming up. Of course, it's it's freaking Florida in the summertime. Let's see what's the temperature in here? Yeah, 90 degrees in here. No biggie, I can handle it. Hey, if we can handle it in the foundry on the ships, we can handle it at the house. All right. Now, you're still forming the back side of these castings with the bottom portion of this, this uh, coat. Uh, yeah, coat. So we still want to make it nice and smooth even though we don't have to worry about getting very uh, worried about, you know, too much tucking and all that. Because I, I'm going on a flat surface. I don't have to really tuck anything because there's no molds, I mean, uh, patterns in there. Okay. I was kind of sweating it because all I have is basically three buckets of, of sand and uh, one, two, three. Yep, three buckets of sand and I wasn't entirely sure that I would have enough to finish everything but thankfully I'll have just enough. So the one thing you got to watch out about with these little skinny flasks they'll move on you so try to hold one well I mean hold it with one hand until you get it pretty much rammed up yes you still strike it off and even though you didn't see it I did 
scratch it off, scratch it off, not strike it off. Striking is when you take the, the bar and taking the very top, most, the stuff you don't want on top that you don't need. It ain't raining tomorrow maybe we'll go ahead and pour this but right now it's raining and the weatherman says it might continue to rain for a little while Somebody, undoubtedly somebody out there, is gonna wonder how's he know how's he gonna know where to punch the the sprue? I mean he doesn't have a pattern there that he can see where the sprue needs to go. Well you're right, I don't need to I don't have the pattern here which would normally tell me where to put the sprue. But knowing that these are relatively standard i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't send it to outer space they're not that good but they're relatively standard in size and thickness and uh so that means i can measure where that one is and transfer it to here Vent holes done. Now, I need a measuring device. Yeah. Put my leggings right there out of the way. Three-eighths in that way, and five and a half down. Okay. All right. Now here's where this little devil comes in play. You find your spot where you need it. Smooth it out as best you can. Get my double ender. 
smooth that out. Just trying to minimize the problem with too much in there. Okay, I've got that cone, that same cone that's there, okay? And there's the sprue. All right. Now we're going to just get rid of the the loose sand so that nothing gets drawn in when it's going down the sprue. Okay. sand okay notice how smooth right here get your no I, notice how smooth that's going to be the back side of that over there the smoother everything is on the casting the less work you've got to do to try and make it look good all right pick it up do not turn it over immediately get it to the point where you can easily turn it over. Then sit it down easy. Now let's see if I, how far off I am. Well, straight shot down. Okay. Always remember, immediately after you put your cope on, sprue cover gets put on. Nothing more disappointing than having something get dripped or flopped into down your down sprue if uh, you don't need to, okay? So, these are ready to be poured, essentially ready. I haven't got them out on deck and I haven't got, them, haven't got any weights on them but they're physically ready to be cool, uh, put out on, out on deck, wherever my deck might be, whether it be out on the driveway or inside here, and get poured. Okay. And this has probably been an hour, I don't know. I usually, I usually take an ungodly amount of time to do these videos, but at least I'm not wasting your time. Everything I tell you is gonna help you making a new casting or a good casting okay all right uh, well I got a shop to clean up shop I got a garage to clean up ye old foundry is dirty right now so I will see you later and Liberty call <laughs>